Hey everyone, this is a refresher for Conan. To set up the game, choose a scenario and then place the game board and decide who is going to be playing as the Overlord. For this video, I'll be using the In the Clutches of the Picks scenario. The heroes will each choose a character, place their model on the board, and then take their hero sheet and any equipment, spells, or item cards that are assigned to them. Then set up the hero gems and split them according to the scenario and place the red gem on the aggressive icon. Then the Overlord will set up the Book of Skellos, splitting the gems according to the scenario. The Overlord will place their models on the board and then place the turn marker and any life point markers. Read the scenario rules and make any special changes to the board, then form the asset deck if needed. Now let's go over the hero sheets. These are the six actions a hero can take. Melee, ranged, guard, movement, manipulation, and reroll. The exertion limits are in red, and this shows you how many gems you can assign to a specific action in the same turn. This is the recovery chart. This shows you how many gems a hero recovers depending on their stance. This is the hero's encumbrance limit. If a hero's encumbrance exceeds the max value, the hero must immediately drop one or more items to reduce their encumbrance level so that it is equal to or less than their max encumbrance. These are the skills that a hero can use. If a hero's encumbrance level is equal to or higher than a skill's encumbrance limit, that skill can't be used. And this is the encumbrance chart. If the hero's encumbrance value is equal to or higher than either encumbrance limit, the hero receives fewer free movement points each turn. This is the reserve zone. Gems that a hero can use will be placed here. Energy gems allow you to take actions, but they also represent a character's life points. The number at the bottom left shows you how many total gems you'll have. This is the fatigue zone. Whenever you use gems, they'll be placed in the fatigue zone. And this is the wound zone. Gems are placed in the wound zone when a hero takes damage. Each time a hero receives damage, they'll move that many gems from their fatigue zone to their wound zone. If there is still more damage to suffer after moving all gems from action spaces, spell cards, and ally tiles, the player moves gems from the reserve zone. When a character dies, their weapon and item cards are placed in the space they died, and their model is removed from the board. Weapon cards can have a melee attack bonus, a guard bonus, which this card does not have, a ranged attack bonus, and an encumbrance value. If there's a hand symbol next to the ranged attack, that means that the weapon will be thrown. It needs to be picked up by performing a simple manipulation before it can be used again. Spell cards have an energy cost at the top in white, and the exertion limit is in red. That's how many gems you can assign to the spell in the same turn. If a spell card has a blast icon, that means that the spell is an area attack and that it affects an entire area and all characters within it. This includes the spellcaster and all friendly and enemy characters. A lightning bolt icon means that the spell is a reaction spell and that it can be cast at any time during the opponent's turn. Using an item is always a free action unless the scenario says otherwise. This means that gems are not assigned to an action space when you use an item. An aggressive hero can use a life potion for free to move two gems from the fatigue zone or wound zone to the reserve zone. Then the card is discarded back to the box. All of the heroes will act within four phases. The start phase, the stance phase, the action phase, and the end phase. In the start phase, move all gems that were spent on the overlord's turn to the fatigue zone. In the stance phase, each hero will choose either the aggressive stance or the cautious stance. Aggressive heroes can use any action. Cautious heroes can only perform guard and reroll actions. They also can't drop an object or cast a spell unless it's a reaction spell. To choose the aggressive stance, place the gem marker on the sun icon. Then move two gems from the fatigue zone to the reserve zone. If one hero was dead, you would move three, and if two heroes were dead, you would instead move four. If instead a hero chooses the cautious stance, place the red gem marker on the moon icon. Then move five gems from the fatigue zone to the reserve zone. And if one hero is dead, you would move six. If two heroes were dead, you would move seven. Once all the heroes have chosen a stance, aggressive heroes can perform any actions they wish to take. The hero team can perform their actions in any order, taking multiple actions per hero or switching back and forth between heroes. This phase ends when heroes cannot or choose not to perform any more actions. When all the heroes have finished performing their actions, each hero moves all the gems used to the fatigue zone. Now let's go over the six actions in more depth. To make a melee attack action, choose an enemy in the same space to attack, or in an occupied space. 
Assign one or more gems from the reserve zone to the attack space. Then choose one weapon with a melee attack bonus to attack with or perform an unarmed attack. For each gem assigned, you're going to roll one die of the type shown on the melee attack space, plus the dice indicated on the chosen weapon card. So that would be two orange dice and one yellow die. Then resolve any rerolls and determine the attack power by adding up the symbols. The arrow symbol on this die means that I can reroll one die of this color. So if I wanted to, I could reroll this die once for free. Heroes can attack the same or different characters as many times as they want during the same turn as long as they adhere to the melee and ranged attack exertion limits. If a hero performs a melee attack action without a weapon card, the attack is considered unarmed, and the final attack power is reduced by two. To make a ranged attack, you need to choose a weapon that has a ranged attack bonus. Then assign gems from the reserve zone to the ranged attack space. Then choose an enemy in line of sight to attack. To determine line of sight, trace a line from one circle in the attacker's area to the circle in the enemy's area. If the line crosses an obstacle on the board, then line of sight is blocked and that hero can't attack. Characters always have line of sight to their own area and distance between two areas doesn't matter. Friendly or enemy models don't block line of sight but can hinder ranged attacks. So for each gem assigned, the hero rolls one die of the type indicated on the ranged attack space, plus the dice indicated on the chosen weapon card. So here we would roll two orange dice and one yellow die. Then resolve any rerolls and determine the attack power by adding up the symbols. If the chosen weapon has a hand symbol next to the ranged attack bonus, the attacker drops the weapon in the defender's area at the end of the attack. Units have an elevation bonus, so whenever a character attacks an enemy at a lower elevation using a ranged attack, the attacker rolls an extra yellow die. When a hero is attacked and after attack power has been determined, the hero can defend against the attack. So let's say that the hyena attacked and they rolled a 2. The hero chooses to defend or not. If they choose to defend, assign one or more gems from the reserve zone to the guard space. The hero can choose one of their equipment cards that has a guard bonus, such as a weapon or a shield. For each gem assigned, the hero will roll one die of the type shown on the guard space, plus the die shown on the chosen equipment card. So then I'd roll two orange dice, one from the guard action and one from the shield. Then you can use any available free rerolls and then choose whether or not to perform any reroll actions. Then subtract the defense power from the attack power to determine the damage. So I'm being attacked with two and defending with one, so I would take one damage. The guard action only blocks single attacks unless the scenario says otherwise. If you're defending against a ranged attack, you can use a shield to defend, but not a weapon. Whenever you defend with equipment, that's called parrying, and whenever you defend without equipment, that's called dodging. Some cards grant armor, which is this symbol here. Armor gives a hero a free defense die to roll, and that can be used each time they are attacked. You don't have to spend any gems to do this. Even if a character doesn't guard, they still use the armor of one of their equipment cards. And heroes must say whether or not they're going to guard before using their armor. So if I was going to defend against this attack, but this time with the leather armor, I would roll one orange die from the guard action, one orange die from the shield, and one yellow die from the leather armor. Now I'll go over the move action. It costs heroes one movement point to move across a border from one area to an adjacent area. Hindering and some terrain effects can increase the number of movement points needed to cross a border. Aggressive heroes gain a number of free movement points equal to their base movement value. These movements are totally free and you don't need to assign gems to use them. The first movement points a hero spends will always use these free movement points. Heroes could start their turn by attacking a unit, then using their free movement points to move as long as it's their first move action this turn. If a moving hero stops to perform any action other than a move, they lose all of their remaining free movement points. Heroes can use gems to gain more move actions. To perform a move action after you've used your free movement points, assign one or more gems from the reserve zone to the move space. For each gem assigned, the hero gains one movement point that must be spent immediately. Now I'll go over the manipulation action. You can use the manipulation action to do simple or complex manipulations. To perform a simple manipulation, take one gem from your reserve zone and place it on the manipulation space. You don't need to roll any dice to perform a simple manipulation. Simple manipulations allow you to pick up, give, take, or catch an object. 
Objects include item and equipment cards, as well as anything specified in the scenario. To perform a complex manipulation, assign one or more gems from the reserve space to the action space. Then you can choose an equipment card that has a manipulation bonus if you have one. For each gem assigned, you're going to roll one of the types shown on the space, plus the dice shown on the chosen equipment card, if any. I put two gems on the manipulation space, so I'd roll two red dice. The manipulation power is equal to the number of symbols shown on the dice. Complex manipulations have difficulties that are determined by the scenario. If the manipulation power is equal to or higher than the manipulation's difficulty, the hero succeeds. And the last action is the reroll action. Heroes can perform a reroll action after rolling dice, but before finalizing the results of the roll. To use the reroll action, assign one or more gems from the reserve zone to the reroll action space. So let's say that I rolled zeros on these dice and I wanted to reroll them. I would assign two gems to the reroll space. Once you assign the gems, then reroll that many dice. So I have two gems, so I roll two dice. A hero can perform the reroll action multiple times and may reroll the same dice or different dice each time. Now I'll go over some additional rules. Hindering affects movements, ranged attacks, and complex manipulations. If your allies aren't keeping all enemies in your space busy, you are hindered by each excess enemy. So as an example, let's say that we have Conan and his ally in one space with an enemy. The ally keeps the one enemy busy and Conan can move out of the space unhindered. So if you had one hero and one enemy in the same space, both characters would be hindered by one if they try to move out of the space. So it would cost two movement points to move out of the space, one normal movement point and one hindered movement point. Each enemy character creating hindering reduces by one the number of successes for ranged attack actions. So if this character here was performing a ranged attack and they rolled a two, they would be hindered by one, so this would turn into a one. To open a chest, perform a complex manipulation while in the chest area. The difficulty is two unless the scenario says otherwise. If you succeed, remove the chest from the board and then take the top card from the asset deck and place it face up next to your hero sheet. When opening a chest, a hero can choose not to pick up the item right away. If this happens, place the top card of the asset deck in the chest area. It can be picked up later by performing a simple manipulation. Complex manipulations are also affected by hindering. Each enemy character creating hindering reduces by one the number of successes for complex manipulations. So if this hero wanted to open the chest, they would need to roll a 5 because they are hindered by 3. Heroes can drop any number of objects in their area as a free action. They don't have to assign any gems to do this. If an object with an area effect is dropped, the effect is resolved as if the object had been thrown. To throw an object, choose an object that has an encumbrance value of 3 or less, and choose an area in line of sight. Then perform a complex manipulation that has the difficulty equal to the distance from the hero to the chosen area. So in this case, it would be 1. So if I assign 1 gem to do a complex manipulation, I'll roll the die. Since I wanted to throw the object 1 space, I would need to roll a 1, which I did, so this would succeed, and I would drop the item in that area. If you fail, drop the object a number of areas away from the hero equal to the manipulation power following line of sight to the chosen area. For example, let's say that I wanted to throw an item two spaces away from my hero. I would need to roll a 2 in order to succeed. If I rolled a 1, I would fail, and the object would drop one space in front of my hero following line of sight to the area that I was trying to throw the item to. When an object is dropped in an area, one hero in that area may immediately perform a simple manipulation to catch the object or pick it up. To cast a spell, assign gems equal to the spell's cost from the reserve zone to the spell card, and the spell's cost is always in white. At the end of the turn, during the end phase, each player moves any gems on their spell cards to their fatigue zone. Characters defend against and suffer damage from spell attacks as they would against other attacks. Whenever you use the teleportation spell, you pay one gem to activate it. Then you can teleport one space for each additional gem that you add. You must pay the activation cost every time you cast the spell. If a weapon has an encumbrance of 2 or less, it's considered a one-handed weapon, and if it has an encumbrance of 3 or more, it's considered a two-handed weapon. The reroll icon, which is this arrow on the die, means that you can reroll one die of the matching type once for free without performing a reroll action. When a character attacks an area, they attack each character in the area. 
The area attack dice are rolled once and apply to each attack. The attacker resolves the attack in the order of their choosing. Guard bonuses from weapon cards can't be used to defend against area attacks. Dodging, armor, and guard bonuses from shields can be used to defend. And asset cards with an area attack icon are disposed of after use. A character can't end its movement or move across an area if the model's base could not fit entirely in that area. These types of spaces are called occupied areas. Occupied areas are within melee range of all adjacent areas. Melee attacks can't be performed from an occupied area to an adjacent area. As a general rule, in the case of an abrupt change in elevation, only the higher areas have line of sight on the lower areas. When line of sight is in doubt, use your best judgment to determine if line of sight exists. Characters can take falling damage. If a hero falls, roll dice as instructed by the scenario. Heroes can use the reroll action to mitigate falling damage. Falling doesn't cause a hero to lose any movement points. If a falling character is carrying another character, both suffer the same damage. Only the carrying character can perform reroll actions. Heroes with the leadership skill can give orders to any ally on the battlefield unless otherwise specified in the scenario. If the scenario involves allies, place the ally tile next to the hero sheet of the hero with the leadership skill. During the action phase, if a hero is in the aggressive stance, they can activate allies by assigning one gem from the reserve zone to the ally tile. Activating an ally allows you to move an attack with one of the ally's models. Assigning one gem activates one ally, and each ally model can only be activated once per action phase. So for example, if I had two camels on the board, activating this ally would only activate one of the models. If I wanted to activate the other model, I would have to pay an additional gem. If an ally attacks, they lose their remaining movement points from their base movement value. The hero can assign additional gems to an activated ally to give them additional movement points that can be used after they spent their base movement or after they attacked. An ally can't gain more movement points in this way than their base movement value, and each gem assigned gives the ally one movement point. The aggressive or cautious hero can also perform a guard action with an ally by assigning gems. For each gem assigned, the hero rolls one orange die. The hero can reroll an ally's dice by assigning one gem per rerolled die. Allies have one life point unless the scenario specifies otherwise. At the end of the action phase, gems that were placed on the ally tiles are moved to the hero's fatigue zone. If all of the heroes with leadership die, the allies are immediately removed from the game. Now I'll go over how to play as the overlord. Gems that you can use will be in the reserve zone and gems that you spend will go to the fatigue zone. The Overlord has two types of tiles, Unit Tiles and Event Tiles. Unit Tiles list the skills a unit has, their free movement points, their armor value, whether they have a melee or ranged attack, and their reinforcement cost. When the Event Tile is activated, the Overlord will perform one of the events listed in the scenario. In some scenarios, the Event Tile is used to resolve more than one event each time the Event Tile is activated. The scenario will tell you whether the heroes or the overlord starts first. The overlord has four turn phases, recovery phase, advanced turn marker, activation phase, and end phase. In the recovery phase, move all the gems spent during the hero's turn to the fatigue zone. Then move gems from the fatigue zone to the recovery zone based on the recovery value. In the advanced turn marker phase, move the turn marker one space. Then in the activation phase, you'll activate zero, one, or two tiles. To activate a tile, you'll pay the activation cost. Then you remove the tile and place it at the end of the river. So if I wanted to activate the picked warriors, I would pay three gems. And then I would place it at the end of the river. If the tile that you activated is a unit tile, then you activate all the units in that group, spending any number of their movement points to move them. The picked warriors can move two spaces, so I can move each unit up to two spaces. And each unit can perform one attack during its activation. So if I activated the picked warriors, I can move each unit up to two spaces, and then I could attack with each unit as well. When a unit attacks, all units in that group lose their remaining movement points. If I activated the picked warriors and I attacked with this unit, I could no longer use the free movement points for these other units. You can activate the same tile again, but you have to pay the new cost. 
If you activate an event tile, you can only resolve one of the events in the scenario unless the scenario says that you can resolve more than one. And in the end phase, move all gems spent into the fatigue zone. Now I'll go over the unit tiles in more depth. These are the free movement points that each unit in the group can use. These free movement points can only be used before a unit in the group attacks. If one unit attacks, all the units in that group lose their remaining movement points. Movement and ranged attacks by Overlord units are affected by hindering. The armor value shows you the damage that's absorbed by each unit in the group when it's attacked. So if one of the picked hunters was being attacked and the heroes rolled a 1, this damage would automatically be absorbed by the armor. This shows you what kind of attack the unit has and how many dice you roll. So in this case it's a melee attack and you roll 2 yellow dice. This shows that both dice can be re-rolled. If you roll two dice of the same color, they can both be re-rolled for free, and you decide to use both of your free re-rolls, each die can only be re-rolled for free once. You can't use both re-rolls on the same die. And the reinforcement cost shows you how many points it costs to move one dead model from that group back to the board. If you activate the event tile and you choose the reinforcement event, you get a certain number of reinforcement points depending on the scenario. So let's say that I activated the event tile and I wanted to bring back three dead picked hunters back to the board. It would cost one reinforcement point to bring each model back to the board. You can place the units in any of the reinforcement areas on the board. Whenever a unit is killed, you move that unit off the board. When all the units from the same tile are dead, you'll flip the tile over and place it at the end of the river. So if all the blue picked hunters were dead, I would flip the tile over and place it at the end of the river. If one or more of the figures from the dead unit tile return as reinforcements, the unit tile is immediately flipped face up and stays in its current position. So if one or more of the blue picked hunters return to the board through reinforcements, then I would flip the tile over and it would stay in its current position. Dead unit tiles can be activated and this counts as one of the two activations the overlord can take. To activate a dead unit tile, pay the cost and then place it at the end of the river. Unnamed characters like hyenas and picked hunters have one life point. Lieutenants and monsters have several life points. You keep track of their life points by placing their marker on the turn track. The Overlord has a special action called Dredging the River, and this doesn't count as one of the two activations they can take. At any time during their turn, the Overlord can remove one or more dead unit tiles from the game. To remove a dead unit tile, the Overlord must permanently return two gems from their fatigue zone to the game box. If there are no gems in the fatigue zone, the gems can be returned from the benefit zones or spell cards. If those are empty, then they take gems from the reserve zone. When units are removed in this fashion, they are removed from the game permanently. Certain overlord units can cast spells. This is in addition to the normal move and attack actions. To cast a spell, activate a unit tile. Pay the cost of the spell and move gems onto the card, then use the spell. If casting a spell on the hero's turn, the spellcaster's unit tile does not need to be activated. The Overlord has three special benefits that they can use, movement, guard, and reroll. After spending a unit's base movement points, the Overlord can pay gems to gain extra movement points. This affects one unit from the currently activated tile, and one gem equals one movement point. A unit can gain at most the number of extra movement points equal to its base movement value during each activation. This benefit can be used before or after an attack, and it can only be used during the Overlord's turn. So if I activated the green picked hunters, I could use my free movement points to move two, then I could pay one extra gem to move another space. The guard action is used to defend against an attack. Whenever one of the Overlord's units are attacked, you can choose to guard. You can assign one or more gems to the guard token. Each gem you assign will allow you to roll one orange die. So for example, if this hero attacked and they rolled a two, I could choose to guard with this unit. If I choose to guard, I place one gem on the guard benefit and I roll one orange die. So I'm being attacked with two. One damage would be absorbed with the armor and the other damage would be absorbed by this die so he would take no damage. If instead this hero rolled a 3, this unit would die unless I wanted to re-roll to try to get a higher result. Only one guard action can be performed per attack, so the Overlord needs to decide how many gems they will assign before rolling dice. The re-roll benefit allows the Overlord to re-roll dice before the results are determined. 
For each gem assigned, the Overlord can reroll one die of their choice. This benefit can be used at any time, including on the hero's turn when using the guard benefit. That's Conan. Thanks for watching, and make sure to subscribe for more Cosmic Tavern.